Welcome. And let's start with why do I call it forensic costuming? Okay. Um, I call it forensic costuming because people said, what are you doing? And I had to say something. <laughs> so it felt like that's what I was doing. And forensic is very popular now. It's a scientific techniques to investigate a crime. And my feeling is what was done to these clothes is a crime. <laughs> so they were hung badly on wire hangers, wooden hangers, whatever hanger, not the right hanger. They were hung in heated spaces, unheated spaces, light damage they have. They were altered, re-altered on top of the alterations. Um, the second part of the term is costuming. These are not, it's not forensic vintage clothing. It's forensic costuming, because I am a costumer, even though I have gotten there via vintage clothing and knowledge of history and clothing and so forth. But uh, I've been doing costuming in, on the West Coast for 40 some years. I did it on the East Coast before that. I grew up in Rhode Island, local girl, studied history, studied <coughs> ballet, uh, studied dance. Went on to think, what am I going to do with myself? So I thought, I'll be a curator at a costume museum. That'll be great. Except the only thing available at the time was the Smithsonian, which was closed for two years, so forget that, and the Field Museum. It didn't exist. People didn't think it was great. It's still a struggle to get places to do costume exhibits. So I went to Northwestern School of Speech. I went to NYU theater school. And part of the reason I went to NYU was the teachers were working on Broadway. Uh, I, I worked on Broadway plays before I finished. I went and did summer stock in North Shore Music Theater in Massachusetts. Uh, when I graduated, I got a call to go back to Rhode Island, do costumes at Trinity Square Repertory Theater, and I did that for five years. I did North Shore Music Theater for five years. And then I got a call from Bonnie Franklin's manager and said, would you be interested in coming out and seeing if you like the West Coast and doing Bonnie's clothes on one day at a time? I visited. I went, for, I went for a week. I went for the rest of the season, and I moved. And this is me moving. <laughs> I had 18 boxes of vintage clothing that I brought with me. I had a two-bedroom apartment because one bedroom was for the clothes. It's always been that way. Uh, I had a three-car garage, had the clothes, no cars. You know, it's just the way it was. Uh, I ended up working for Norman Lear's company. We know who Norman Lear is? OK. I was really lucky. I had no idea how lucky I was. First of all, it's all theater actors, mostly. Theater writers. Done like theatrical shows. We did two shows with a live audience. It was really amazing. And I did it for 12 years. And I did one day at a time the whole season. I did four seasons of The Jeffersons. I did a little bit of Who's the Boss. I did the pilot to Who's the Boss. I actually forgot that one. I did Silver Spoons the whole season. I did um, uh, My Two Dads. I'm trying to think of the others. I worked on a show later called Beekman's World, which was a kid's science show. And that was great. I did all of that. And that was so much more like doing theater, because it was, hey, kids, anyone who has a solution to this problem, how to do this, speak up real team effort. So I, I had a really great experience. Anyway, it's like you have to rethink what you do. Now, I've been lucky. I have done costume my whole life, variations on it. But I have to rethink the focus of what it is. So I ran the costume storage department of, or I created it and then ran it. I said, you need this for Norman Lear's companies. And I, we started having this collective of all the clothes that they could every other show could rent, because you have to clear the clothes out. From if, you, if you're a series and you've bought closets for each person, which you do use again and again, at the beginning of the next season, if you're lucky enough to be picked up, you have to get rid of those old clothes, because style has changed. Sizes might have changed. Um, they just don't want to wear it anymore. I mean, whatever it is. And so you then put it in a collective spot where everybody can share it. So I became the manager of that. 
And then I went on to uh, become a supervisor on shows. And a supervisor on TV shows or films is a manager of the other costumers. So when I was in London, I went to see the Princess Diana display of dresses, which toured our country, I think, twice. And I never went. But then when I went to Kensington, I walked into the palace, and there was the exhibit. And the last dress in the exhibit was the one that interested me the most. It was inside out. I could see how it was constructed. And it was as beautiful inside as it was outside. It was, you could have, you could couldn't wear it that way, but it was finished in a way that all Diana had to do was step into that dress, put it on, zip it up, everything was in the right spot. I had heard about this and seen it in Broadway costumes when I worked in New York, where the inside of the leading lady's outfit was as beautiful as the outside. They were finished with silks. They were, because they're custom made for that person, and they are the lead, and you want them to to feel like a princess if that's the character. And even if it's, I, mean, I remember doing a Man of La Mancha, um, and is it Aldonza, I think, is the character, and she's wearing rags. The rags were raw silk. <laughs> now, two reasons. They feel better than burlap or something. And secondly, they move wonderfully. So another influence, and in something I went to see sort of as an exhibit, Bob Mackey, who we all know, he did a line of clothes. Before he did QVC, he did really clothes for department stores. And he had a line of gowns, and they were at iMagnons in Beverly Hills. And I went there, and I'm in iMagnons looking through the racks, going through the insides of the dresses. <laughs> and the sale, sales lady comes over, you know, what are you doing? And I said, learning. What struck me about those, to be honest, is they were more theatrical then they were clothing. They weren't couture, because couture has a lighter hand. When you pick that dress up, it doesn't weigh. His were more like costumes that you can sense the bones and feel the indestructibleness of them. So always looking at what is in there. So, But I don't consider myself a conservationist, because that would be putting the things. There are rules to conservation. I joined the Costume Society of America at one point, and I rejoined recently. And through it, I learned a lot about uh, curating, the rules of curating, the uh, there are a lot of librarians, curators, museum people, exhibitions, all kinds of things that I knew nothing about. They weren't part of my world. I respect them. It's fine. It's just not what I do. What I do is fix costumes for display. Okay. The other aspect, which I think everybody who deals with vintage clothes, is fix clothes for them to be worn again. So they're two different things, because the strain on a costume uh, being worn, if, especially if it's vintage, or simply old costumes, is different than putting it on a mannequin. So most of what we're talking about is for display. They're never going back on a human body again. And so there are a lot of costumes that I have, a lot of Vintage clothing, bodices, and so forth that are for study for me and for anyone else who asks me, because that's how you learn. You learn by looking inside the garment sometimes, at how it's built, how it's made. And we build costumes when you work in the theater. You usually build them. You don't sew them. You, and you know immediately when people use that term, because that, that's the only people I know that talk about that. So let's go to the first outfit. Head. This is you're, you're looking through the upper layer at the stiffener that's inside, and you're looking through holes there to the lining, and that. So I had to figure out a way to cover it. So now I'm aware of conservation. I'm not going to cut away. I'm not going to remove anything. I'm going to cover it, tack down the pieces so they can stay down. I'm not using iron on. I'm not using double stick. I'm holding it in place, and then I got uh, silk charmeuse because it was the closest I could find in reflection of light. So when you're restoring something, you have to think about how does the weave look like the weave of the garment that you're restoring, and you have to pay attention to the grain of the piece because it is the reflection of the light that tells you that it's, it's not a patch. It's original. 
which is, you know, what we're trying to do is to bring it back to the glory of what the designer did for that actress. Um, so here, I've got the silk charmeuse. I can't get exactly the color I want, but I get the closest I can, and I dip it to match. I do a lot of dyeing. Again, from theater, you do a lot of dyeing, because you can never get the color you want. People said, why do you use it inside out? Because well, it looks more like what I want it to be inside out. I mean, it's what you do. You, you find a way. So I dip the fabric. Then I cut it so that the seams match, the grain matches. And I, fortunately, with this one, I could slide it under the black velvet and just stitch the black velvet down. So you choose. We discuss. It's not my decision alone how this is done. It's a discussion of what is the end product you want. So here's another dress that Randall pulled out after he identified it. Which was in the first uh, Beat of Heads show here in uh, Lancaster. And he identified it because it's a very unique fabric print. So one of the good things about this is because it had that fabric, I could look at the picture. We could, I used to run it back and forward. I put it on the big screen TV. I took pictures of it. I'm, you know, for reference, I could say, OK, this piece of the pattern has to meet this piece of the pattern to create the pleat. I really had a guide for me. So now I had to take this dress, which I felt that the skirt had been unpicked. All the stitches had been taken out. So it was two big pieces of fabric. And then the top was loose, and it had the skirt was lifted over the top. I and it, I felt it was redone for something like what used to be um, baby doll dresses, which were kind of loose dresses in the 80s that kids wore. And, uh, they, I, and I think part of it started by wearing old 40s dresses that were big over your whatever it was, your, your shoulder pads and whatever, and it's going on cool and fabulous. Well, they were doing whatever. Somebody went into stock, pulled this out, thought, great print. I'll do that. It's also possible the thread was rotten, because the thread does get rotten over time. In order to put it back together again, aside from studying the lines, I dyed china silk to try to match the background, the white, the off-white, and put everything back in place, and then said, well, I can't just leave it like that. I have to put something to control it and to put the stress on that new fabric there behind. So there's. China silk on the arms. This side obviously had more wear than that side. And if you think about it, we're looking at the dress inside out. That's actually this side, which is probably where this dress had an opening. So it got more damage because it's handled more. The skirt I lined from the top of the waist down to the bottom below the pleats so that, again, the stitching would be on the china silk, in essence, not on the fabric. Now, it's on the fabric, and I actually had the little pinholes from the stitches that I could use as a guide, and I had to just reassemble which pleat went where, and is it the inside pleat or the outside? You know, is it because it's, it doesn't tell me at this point anymore. You don't see the folds. You just see the stitches. And I was able to put this back together again. This little dress, this is it finished. And I had learned at this point something that I wish I had known from the beginning, which is to take pictures. Well, I always took pictures, not enough pictures. Take pictures as you go along. And additionally, if you're on a digital camera, type what the picture is. Because on this was the one that taught me this. I would look at the piece and go, the left sleeve or the right sleeve? Am I looking at it this way? Am I because I didn't do that at this point. So you learn by doing, or, or you don't, and then you just learn it over and over again. So here's, here's OK, here is right shoulder. <laughs> this is what I got. And if you flip to the next one, left shoulder. So this is why he couldn't display this garment. He liked it a whole lot, and it's very unusual to find 20s pajama lounging. They just, we all know this stuff existed, but it didn't survive. Why did it survive? Because it is actually chiffon. 
You can't tell that, but it was completely backed onto this black cotton, really solid black cotton. That's what kept it alive as long as it did. And it wasn't something, I never even considered taking this apart. Uh, there wasn't any reason. Sometimes I have to take things completely apart. I had to take the lining out because the lining was shredding and falling apart. And inside this lining was a stiffener in the hem to hold out the skirt and weights also to keep it down because it, when people move, maybe it was a dance number. Who knows? You want it to always fall back. The thing about this outfit is the panels are very narrow. There's nothing wide about this fabric. So the repeat is fairly narrow. But you can see, if you look at it, the shape of the trees going up. And so the guide here is the design, the layout and movement of those trees that I have to match as it goes up to the shoulder to try to repair it. When I took the lining out, I was lucky to have extra fabric in the seam allowance. I have to do the whole garment at once to find the pieces that go where they are the most helpful and then piece that little curve goes up to this angle, piece it in. And in the end, I ended up, because it also had holes all under the arms of the body and the sleeves. Additionally, all those buttons were not there. About seven of them weren't there, some at the top, some in the middle, some at the bottom, but all the loops were there. So I knew how many buttons there should be. I had to find a button that shape. And believe me, Joann's doesn't sell them right now. It's not a hot commodity. But in my collection of buttons, I had a button that fit exactly the measurement that I covered in black fabric and took those little bits of leftover gold and put it on the, well, I put it on the fabric before I put it on the button so that it was attached and sewed it on. I also reinforced all the loops because I didn't want to, but I did because the process of putting the loops over the buttons was also what took the fabric off. So I eased every loop just a little bit looser. We really do try to put these back to be the original outfit that that designer did for that star. That is the point of it, not for you to be seeing clothes that aren't real. You know, they're not reproductions of it. I did learn on this. Here's the one, one thing I learned and took with me from it. Well, I learned a lot of things. But um, is not to put a piece, unless I was hitting the seam, because there is a seam right here in this. There is a shoulder seam. But if you're patching here, don't put a straight piece of fabric there, because nothing on this is straight. Put a curve in. Whether you're putting the fabric under what's there and then stitching, or you're putting it over what's there and stitching, try to put a curve in because it will disappear into the fabric where a straight line, again, reflection of light, says, ha, I'm here, I'm a patch. So those are things you just, I, I never knew that, but it taught me something. This was one we said, we can't figure out how this goes together because it had been altered and it made no sense. The first issue was, we can't figure out where the bow goes. It just makes no sense. It's because it had been moved. And in looking at the bodice in this jacket, it had been moved many times. I was fortunate that there were old snaps still left because people were in a hurry and they didn't take the old one off. Or inside there was a, often a reinforced patch which was used to either swing tack through or sew the snap on. And that was still there. Now, why would you have a circle of fabric reinforced inside a garment if you didn't have a hole in it? There's just no reason. So again, forensics at work. And so finally, one day, I called him. I said, I've got the jacket back. You know, This is what I think it does. I said, but don't you notice anything else wrong with this? Do you? It's hard. Look at that. Look at this. There's a little something wrong in the neckline. I said, we have a problem here, because this fabric doesn't exist anymore. I used this fabric in white and silver, white and, black, uh, white and gold. I mean, it's been around forever. Well, OK, so from the 50s to probably 10 years ago. And now it's just over. And uh, I'm not going to find it. 
But I turn the jacket inside out, put it on the mannequin and look at it. And I start to pick the stitches out. All of the fabric of that collar was inside that jacket. Somebody cared. They, re they read the part that says, do not cut, <laughs> which is on every rental sheet. You can alter, do not cut. They did not cut. I was able to bring, take out the elastic, lift the little edge up, save every inch. The hardest part, actually, was getting the curve of that neckline back up because it, it's just not logical when you look at it because it, someone figured out there's a dart within the fabric and once, you know, just look at it and look at it and try to figure it out and I got it to ease itself back and be lovely. I was so thrilled when that happened. So all Randall had for this was this lovely publicity photo. We don't have the film. We know he knows who the actress is, and Todd. That's it. But he really came to me and said, this is just such an interesting dress. We really have to fix this dress. And one of the things about this dress is that it really is a costume, a costume for to be a costume because of the construction of it. For those of you that make theatrical costumes, most of the time they are flatlined and the seams are exposed inside so that you can alter them for different people. That is exactly what you're doing. And that's how this was made. The other thing about it is, if you look at it, you realize all this embroidery and beading is done on the outer layer of the fabric. And then it's lined, which is the same as you would do it today. Uh, if you're sending something out to be beaded, you don't try to bead or have it embroidered through two layers of fabric. You do the one layer. So, but the, but the, the fact that it was flatlined was the problem because every inch of it was flatlined and every inch of that lining, oh, where's that? Oh, here. Looked like this. It's what? Just shredding, cracking, breaking apart. So the outside of the dress looked pretty good. And it could have gone on to be displayed as it was, except that every time Randall would have put it over the mannequin, he'd be screaming at me, going, why didn't you fix this? Because every time I put it on and off the mannequin, more of it fell apart. And I went, oh, Lord, I better fix this before it isn't there. And I don't have the guideline. Because the, the secrets are actually showing in the seams in the lining. Not in, because once I take the lining out, all that stitching's gone. So when I took a picture of it, that's the dress when I got it. And I posed it the way the picture is so that I would have some comparison. There's no bustle. There's no medallion. And look at the back side back seam. It's been let out. The same clue as the front in the opposite way. There's an empty blank space in those lines going up the back. Can you see that on there? So those are clues to what's been done. And then you open up the dress, and it tells you what tell Different color threads when they do alterations, different sizes of stitches. All of those are clues to alterations. Here's a back panel. And when you look at this, you can see it's telling me the design. So there's two beads between every loop. There's a bead in the loop. There were beads, short trumpet beads, running along all of the outside waves of this. This was the hardest bead to duplicate because it's a teardrop upside down, and it's just an odd size. I could actually find bigger ones, but, which worked here. But I had a hard time, so I actually had to, I found something in the final. I took, I took the good ones off the back, put them to the front and then replace the back ones with something I found that was the right length, the right shape from the Newburger beads place. And I know there are three of them back there. And if you can find them later, good for you. <laughs> and you will. You'll, you'll find them. I know you will. But uh, so, so it was a lot of hand beading this all back together again before I relined it. Because now I'm going to have a finished, clean, flat lining inside. I relined it with a uh, polyester taffeta, 
And part of the two reasons. Have you gone to buy taffeta lately in a store? Apparently, it's not a popular fabric anymore. We don't use it. So it became hard to find. And a polyester isn't going to disintegrate or hurt the fabric. So we chose a polyester. I, had, I found enough in one color, which now I might have done something different, but I did what I did. So I'm committed to it. If you look under here, you'll. Okay, maybe a little too yellow. But who's seeing the lining? <laughs> you have to make your choices and move on. The, the fringe, I took out all the wrong fringe, all the replacement fringe, and then made new fringe. Sitting there beading all those, found the beads in my collection, learned a whole lot about beading needles, <laughs> bent a lot of beading needles. <laughs> uh, just, I... I well, I love learning new things, don't we all, really? Yeah. So this is the inside of the center back placket. Now, fortunately, they had made the placket as a separate piece, which I then unstitched. So all the hooks and eyes are the original hooks and eyes. And the, part of the reason it's, you can tell it's a theatrical, at least feeling costumes, and it's those big hooks and eyes. Maybe it was a quick change, but... In a film, you don't need a quick change. In theater, you need a quick change. So who knows? We don't know. But see all these little pleats here? Another thing about this dress is it is 200% asymmetrical at the bottom and totally symmetrical at the top. So I could tell from working on it that they had moved things as it was fitted and then sewn it into place. And that was it. There was no, you're going to lay it out and find this beautiful pattern. That's the dress laid out. So what I ended up doing was thread marking all those pleats because they were going to be gone. The lining's going to be gone. Bye-bye. I'm about to press and wash this fabric. Those pleats, bye-bye. But I did have as a guide um, discoloration of the fabric. It had faded where it was exposed. It's a hair darker in the pleat. You take what you can get, you know. So at this point, I'm looking at this dress, which I've got the skirt unlined. It's got this nice, lovely dirt line and a second dirt line. That's the back because it was worn without a uh, bustle. So it's too long. Shorten it. And then it wears along that edge and collects dirt. Nobody probably had this dry cleaned or cleaned because it would be expensive. And if I was a dry cleaner, I'd probably say, take it away. Because <laughs> they don't want to take that chance. Um, so I have washed a lot of things. And I'll, I, I thought of this yesterday. I had a fire in my house many years ago. And I had all of my vintage fabrics, or not all. 75% of my vintage fabrics were either burned holes in them, like every fold has a burn hole, or it's smoked. And they told me to throw them all out. Would you throw them all out? No. I think about two years ago, I washed the last one. It's been 20 years. It took a while, as needed. You know. uh, initially, I did a lot of them. And a lot of what I've learned, I also learned because of that process, like... Don't throw your vintage fabric in the washing machine. It probably can't take that. Wash it by hand. My husband calls me scrubby. <laughs> Where are you? Out in the garage, scrubbing the... Get a set tub, get a basin. I do use my bathtub, but it's really hard on your back. So I prefer to have a deep set tub to work in. So I'm trying to get the dirt out. But you have to be careful, because when the dirt goes, it may be the only thing holding that fabric together. So now I'm lining inside of that fold with, again, a dyed-to-match piece of probably, I don't really remember now, I'm going to say it's a china silk, or whatever I found worked the best. 
to not show, to match in color, to hold it together, and hand stitching this top and bottom, and weaving between the threads down to this fabric, and doing all that before I flatline it. I will go back. Part I, I skipped the fact about all the washing of the fabric. Aside from putting it in the washing machine and not doing that, fabric also, when it's wet, gets heavy and will destroy itself. So there are techniques of washing. Before I put it into a tub of water or a basin of water, if it's antique lace, whatever, I put baking soda in because baking soda, soda it's my New England, will stop the acid that is created when dirt, particularly old dirt, it's not new dirt, but old dirt, hits water, creates an acid, baking soda cancels that out, and you won't have the fibers eaten by the chemicals in the water. So that's the first thing you want to do, and I do that even if I think it's a fabric it's not going to happen to because there's no guarantee. Yeah. Can you recommend a ratio of how much baking soda and how much water? Yeah, I, I actually should, next time I'm going to start measuring. But I would say if I'm doing a, um, a bucket or a, a sink, a regular sink, not a setup, but a regular sink, it's probably like um, a coffee scoop, a, what would that be, a quarter of a cup to a, a basin of water. If I'm doing a bathtub, it's probably closer to a whole cup sprinkled through it and mixed, and then the garment. Now, the garment goes in, but here's what I learned again. Put a support under the fabric. Because if it's small enough that you can put it in the water, pick it out, squeeze it with your hands, and you've got the whole thing, it's fine. Your hands are the support. But if it's so big that you're going to be pulling on the garment and the fabric, put a piece of netting bigger than the garment under it. So you're creating a soft basket, you could say, for the garment. So you're dipping it in and lifting it out with the netting or holding the netting with the fabric so the strain is not on the garment. Because fabric, it's amazing. Having learned this, while it's wet, it can disintegrate, shred. You let it dry, you iron it, and it's as if you never had it fall apart on you. You're like, what? It is just amazing. It's the, the fiber getting, puffing up from the water and changing, and also losing some of its fiber while it's wet, which is a problem. I rinse it a lot. I use often as a, I put it back in, in detergent, and what I use is not detergent. I use, uh, although I've used wool light. I use um, basic 99 cent hair shampoo because it's a natural fiber. This is a natural fiber. I, and I didn't make this one up. I actually got it out of a book called Caring for Textiles. And that was written in the 70s, and there's a picture at the end of that. Then I rinse it and rinse it so that there's no brown or it's usually brown coming out of the water, not dirt color. It's I've yet to solve that one. I rinse it with diluted hair conditioner. The hair conditioner makes, you know how it makes your hair go smoother? It makes the fabric go smoother. It softens it again. They aren't, the pieces aren't pushing against each other of the fiber. And I, I knew it was going to go on display. That's the whole point. So I made... On the next page, a bustle pad and hip, with hip pads because the dress, I could tell in making it that the, the draping of the fabric was done to go over a lady who was corseted and then went out. And if it didn't go out, the dress was sort of like, yeah, I'm pretty, <laughs> but you want it to be lovely. So I made this, and that travels with this dress, not for anything else. I remade the original petticoat, which was totally shattering apart, and just remade one to match the lining, because it was the same material as the lining originally. And then I put it back together again. You're looking at the finished, the beads are all back in the loops. Everything's back in line. That's how it looked in the beginning. That's how it looked at the end. 
and I didn't, when I got the dress, it had two black bows, identical bows on top of each other, not very pretty bows, the second set, and I took them off, and once I put the bustle on, I realized I didn't need the second one. It probably was someone's attempt to give a bustle effect to it. And I can't remember if it was constructed. Somehow I figured out the construction. The bow actually is on the bodice, which is part of the reason they could do sort of that rather large, unattractive placket closing, because that has big hooks and eyes and so forth. You would have to do a much nicer thing if this was an exposed uh, center back. But they knew what they were doing beforehand, so they did what they could to make it expedient to get it on and off. This is a little project I did. It took about a year <coughs> for the movie White Christmas. And you know the number of sisters, Rosemary Clooney and Vera Ellen. This is a Paramount film, but Paramount does not have the costumes. That's true of many things. But Randall knew the man who had these costumes. He bought each one separately at auction, right? Yeah. And he runs the Rosemary Clooney Museum in Augusta, Kentucky. Yes. OK. This is the movie. This is what I got. Do you see any difference in these dresses? Anyone? Yell it out. I mean, clearly the neckline of Vera Ellen is missing. What neckline? Right? Um, this is longer, that skirt, than this. I counted the layers of the petticoats. The one had seven, one had four. People had, this was just chopped off three inches, just right across the design, everything cut off. I also think on the next page was one of the things that made me feel that because Rosemary Clooney's uh, waist is a 26 in this, and Vera Ellen's is a 19, the Rosemary Clooney's was used a lot. But I think it was also washed or some kind of strange dry cleaning that uh, caused it to, to run because they, they were made the same way. That white band is blue, so the dye has run into it, and it's run onto the boning. Now, it might have been washed. I will say that that skirt was pretty dirty. For a net skirt, and it was just, it looked like it had just been used a lot. If you go to the next one, this is me doing liposuction on a mannequin. <laughs> I felt a little like I was, I feel it must have been around Thanksgiving because I felt like I was carving the turkey. So my big problem was this lace. Where am I going to get the lace? If you were trying to get this lace, it's from, what did we say, 1954? So it's really 40s lace. And it's a cotton lace. It's dimensional. Uh, lace like doesn't look like this now. Lace now is on a net. It, it tends to be more uh, f flatter to the fabric with beads on it. That's where we are today. I went to International Silks and Woolens in LA, which is the company that the, use, supplies fabrics for a lot of shows, for a lot of productions, movies, because they save vintage fabrics and they buy out companies. I bought from them. They were buying out a store called Beverly Hills Silks and Woolens. It had been in business since the 40s. All the designers went to it. I went there. I saw these fabrics up on, and it really was on the fourth shelf to the top of the building. It had water damage in it because that was one of the problems. So I knew that there wasn't going to be perfect fabric there. But I could see that it had uh, printed um, organzas, tools, um, all kinds of other netting and lace. And they said, we agreed on a flat price for all of it. I said, you don't pick out of it, and I'll take it as is. Took that all home and stuck it up on a shelf for, you know, 10 years, whatever, probably 20 years. And here comes this dress, and I think, hmm, I might have that. So I look at it, and I start to study the pattern of the lace, of the original lace trying to find this lace. I don't have exactly that. 
International Silks doesn't have exactly that. I call New York stores that I know, send them pictures, email. I contact a lace company in New York, in, in uh, France that I bought from, Switzerland, and China. That was pretty much, I'm not saying South America, there's not something, who knows. But it can only go so far. On top of that, the other problem is, yeah, China will make me the lace. They're going to want to make thousands of yards, and the price is going to be astronomical. And suppose it's not right. You know, we've got all those things to consider, and it, mainly the time is limited, even though it did take me a year. Um, so I studied the pattern of the lace. So I have the body of the lace down here. And I studied the flow of the leaves and the shape of the flowers. It's sort of the same principle as that gold and black. You're going for what's, what is the eye going to accept as the same thing. So here's the sleeve sort of in the process. So you're, you're seeing the flower, the flower. This is their flower. This is my flower. Now, the curve of the lace, the, of the leaf that I got was a little more curled, but it was as close as I could get, and I'm not about to cut that leaf up and straighten it. There, there are some limits. And this is Vera Ellen, redone. And then I think there's one more in this group slide. So here's Vera Ellen finished. Here's Rosemary finished, but not on the right mannequin. This was, uh, do, you, do you know Alex Jersey? Do you know that fabric at all? It's a rayon jersey. It was really popular from the 40s to the 70s, into dynasty period even, because it's very slinky. So it's used, but it grows also. It's a, it's a knitted, it's a jersey. And uh, I don't think it's called Alex Jersey everywhere, but in international silks and woolens, it's Alex Jersey. And this dress was made out of two layers of Alex Jersey. This is the dress finished. What Randall brought me was a dirty version of this dress. <laughs> and I tried to spot clean the hem. And the problem was I did spot clean the hem, and now the spot looks great, and above it and below it, it's dirty. So I think <coughs> cleverly that I will now soak the hem and the bottom section in the tub, having done the process, and putting, oh, and using I think at the time I used Clorox too, because that was what was popular. Now there's Biz, there's OxyClean, there's a couple of different products. They're all enzymatic cleaners that are working by themselves. You swish it around now and then and go away. And they work into the fiber to release the dirt or stain that's there. I walked away thinking, one of the things you have to have is patience. You need to not mess around with it while it's doing its process. Don't take it out too soon. I walk away. I come back, and that wet dirt has creeped right up the dress over to the waistband. I shouldn't have walked away so long, but I did. There's no going back. So now I have to take the dress apart, and I did call Randall because it was just, <gasps> this dress is brilliantly constructed, twisted and wrapped. Now this is a beaded applique, these two pieces. That I didn't have to take, recreate the beaded applique. They actually came off. I just had to thread mark exactly where everything went. I soak the pieces quickly, because when you get a watermark on some things, sometimes it will stay there, even though you're the one who put it in. It's decided it likes where it is now. I'm dealing with that right now at home. Uh, so I did get it out. I did reconstruct the dress, and it really came out looking quite stunning. So the lesson, I had a few lessons here. This is a Veronica Lake dress. You want to be careful with it. But I, I saw this spot here, and I thought, I'll get that clean, except when I went in to look at it, it's not a spot. It is an actual hole where the fabric, it's not a whole hole. The fibers between the warp and the weft have actually fallen out from where? They're gone. So the only thing I could do there is to back it with a fabric dyed to match and as close a weave, a light reflective as what was originally there. Tack those fibers to it, stitch by stitch, 
This is where patience comes in. And let that sleeve live again. I also, there were beads missing, so I had to rebead. And I believe that this is another one that I did wash. And yeah, I'm pretty sure. So here's the bodice redone. And the thing about the bodices, because they're under a lot of dresses, they aren't always made out of the same material. It depends on the dress. This is a very soft dress, but probably this actress, Veronica Lake, is not wearing any undergarments under this. So the bodice is fitted <coughs> right against her skin and holds her into place. And a lot of those very slinky 30s dresses, that look like you couldn't possibly wear anything under them. Probably had some sort of an early body stocking. And it could be this net. And what I use to replace those is this 100% cotton net that comes from England. That's where I buy it. That is woven, that is knitted, I guess, twice a year in Switzerland. And it is used to make ballet costumes, ballet tutus. Randall brought this little jewel over. And again, we have the discussion, can you fix this? Do you think you can do this? And I'm like, I'll try. Because I don't honestly know when he shows it to me what's really wrong with it. Because there's often more wrong with it than what he sees as the problem. But we both like this dress. And when you come up, come up and look at this later. This is three-dimensional beading. I've never seen this, this middle one, at the this top one here, is beads going up, beads across, beads down. It is really beautiful beading. So how am I going to deal with this dress? So now here's, here's what you've got. This is what's really presented to me. It's been repaired at least three times. Someone has come along and cut chunks out of the seam allowance and used it, I think it's on this one, there's a chunk down here where they've tried to fill in the hole. Okay. Another time they took this velvet and they put the wrong side of the velvet, which was a great color match, and held it in place with iron-on interfacing. So here's the inside. I dyed this cotton as close as I could, feeling that, I mean, I could have used black, I could have, I, it just feels better to me and because I think a hole could open up again. And I would rather have something that it can just be tacked to in there. I use the uh, armhole seams, the side seams. The, there is a seam right down here, front and back. Those are my support seams, because they're stitched already. Now, I did sew the very first seam on the back with the machine. And after that, I decided not to. Because when I sewed the second seam like that, I had to pull it out because it, it pulled. I tend to do it all by hand, all of it by hand. Didn't do the side seams and the long seams of this. This is machine. I'm not as crazy as I might seem. But on smaller things, I think that hand stitching, back stitching, cross stitch, whatever it is, is it's better to do it right once. So tools. Big fan of a really good steam iron. I use an industrial steam iron. I have an old Sussman with a tank. No, I don't have the tank. I have one with a tank, but I have one with a pressure tank here. It's a little button that you push. But there's also the ones that have the bottle up here. And the, you, get, you can push the button and get steam out of it. And the thing is that a lot of times you really don't put the iron on the fabric. You simply get it to relax back. And you get it, tailoring does this a lot of times. They, they shoot it with steam, and then they take a little block, and they pat it to get the threads to lay flat. And so I, I will take that tip from them. I mean, I'll take a tip from anywhere that makes it work. Good hand needles. I discovered, I asked a couple of costumers. First of all, half of them don't sew, the ones on set in L.A. I'm not talking about y'all. So they've learned to, to take the biggest needle with the biggest eye that they can see and sew the button on. And that is what they need to do. But that's not the way to sew something. And then you get it back, and it's just a nightmare. And now you're taking it out if you see it. If you don't see it, the garment goes back into stock. 
done however they did it. But I think that little short betweens are important. I think sharps are what I use mostly because they go through everything really nicely. And then you can't, this one, couldn't find a beading needle small enough to go through it. I don't know whether, you know, if I was in England, maybe it's there. I don't know, but I couldn't buy one tiny enough to go through. So I went around the beads where I could to hold them down. It's mostly the tips where they tend to loosen. Let's see. Oh, the other thing is everybody's pushing these uh, pins with the ball, ball ends that are fairly long. And my, I was with another costume house in the workroom. All love those pins. And I'm the one sitting there with the old pins that are about that long with the metal tip because I can pin my entire seam with that line of pins and look at it and see exactly what it's going to be so that I don't waste my time. Those long pins are wonderful for what they're wonderful for, but they are distorting to things, and on top of that, they hurt my fingers a lot. Yeah. Good seam rippers. I have about 12. I can usually find one if I'm lucky. And I didn't know that they get dull. I had no idea that they get dull, but they do. And so I do seam rippers like wonderful. But I tend to use single-edged razor blades a lot. It's what I, I don't know why I learned to use those from the beginning, but since I was like a little kid sewing, I used them. Good scissors, a good cutting scissors, a good snipping scissors with a good point. And again, I have lots of scissors because I put them down, I put it whatever I'm working on on top of it, and then I have to go get another pair of scissors. And when the project is ended, Find all my scissors. It's fine. Um, can't have too many thread colors, really, because you think the right color is something. So I thought when I went in the drawer that this was the right color thread for this dress. It's pretty good. Now, first of all, this dress is not the same color throughout. It is faded from the light. But in fact, when I went to sew it, this thread turned out to be the thread that worked because it actually disappeared and it didn't reflect the light. So it isn't always what you think it will be. You always have to have options, and having a lot of thread makes it easier. You know, and it can be uh, any good thread. But I do have a lot of old threads, and some old threads, I don't know, they, they seem to be right. They're all different. There are some that are different thicknesses. In fact, when you were asking me about the lace, I believe I used overlock thread, possibly, because it's a little thicker. Old cotton overlock, because it's, it's got a little bit thicker finish to it than today's threads. I didn't used to use wax much except for zippers, and now I use it often on thread, and especially, again, this one, because I'd get halfway through the reweaving process and it would knot up, and I got the wax out. And move forward with it. And if you've been taught well, you probably were taught to use that. But I wasn't taught to use that. You were probably also taught to use thimbles. I was, I, they tried. They tried. They didn't do well. Um, I, I learned that the thimble that I can use occasionally, if I can find it, is apparently called a, oops, I can't see it here. It's a tailor's thimble. Oh, here it is, which is open on the top. That way I can push with the side. And, and I usually don't go get my thimble till I have a hole in my finger. <laughs> then I go get my thimble. I, I always make it a challenge when I'm working on something. It's just a game I play where I try to do the whole project as much as I can with one needle. If I really like a needle, keep track of it and keep using it and not drop it on the floor, not put it down. It's just a game I started to play because it gets frustrating because I can't have that many needles. And when I worked in a workroom with other people, everybody takes the needle and your favorite. You, you can't label a needle. You know? So the best tool you can have is patience. A really good light. Now, I, some of you are older. Some of you aren't. I've gotten to the point where the ability to see with a good LED work lamp that I can put right down over my project has made it possible for me to keep working. Without that, I really probably would have had to call Randall up and say, we're done. I can't see this anymore. I just can't see it. 
but I found a work light at the hardware store by Ryobi, which is battery charge. You can recharge it, and you can put it right over it, and I can put it below my eyesight so the light isn't affecting my eyes, and I can work into the night, put on a good audio book, music, TV show, and sort of zen out with it. And it's really quite wonderful. And at 2 a.m., someone says, are you going to bed? And you go, but I just have a few more inches. <laughs> so I talked a little bit about these. The washing machine, the baking soda, support under the garment, the shampoo, the rinsing, rolling the fabric in the towel, lay it out flat. Oh, I started long ago ironing fabric when I'm fixing things from the inside. I iron the stuff because you don't want to, a lot of fabrics mark when you iron them. You don't want to do that. And the other thing I work on is ironing with the grain, the cross and the straight, trying to get the biases to ease back away because, you, I mean, you want them again because often the reason the bias is there for its function, but give it a chance to go back to its original flat fabric, especially if you have washed it, dried it, and are trying to put it back together. And sometimes I'm trying to match up that seam to this seam, and this side is stretched out, and that side isn't, and I need to coax it back. And I just started recently using a good ham, is always a lovely piece to use, a sleeve board. And then I found this, uh, like a ham, it's a tube. I have no idea other than to call it a tube. It's made just like a ham. It's plaid wool on one side and canvas on the other side. And the thing that I used it for is when you are, I think I used it on this little baby, when you want to press a seam open from the inside, but you don't want to press anything else about it except that seam. Put it on the little tube. I mean, you can do it with a sleeve board to a degree, but you just have to be really careful because your iron can cause you a new problem, as I'm sure we have all had that happen. This is the book that I read one summer when I was working on a show. Uh, we used to go to the set, get onto a bus, and we had a half hour drive to the set. And I read this book in there, I got a few things that somehow went into the back of my brain and at the time and stayed with me because I've always been interested in cleaning and reviving clothes. The vintage clothes I bought, everything. I tended to buy vintage clothes that had something wrong with them because they were cheaper, and I can fix it, right? And I don't feel bad altering it. Whereas something that is perfect, I want to maintain the way it is.